Felix here. Good evening to you or good morning to you. Good evening here from Hong Kong. Thank you for joining me. Now, if you want to be as happy and excited as I am about the market today, despite everything looking pretty red and uh, news items looking pretty glum, well, come and join me on the Master Stocks Academy program down below and you will be as calm and controlled because you will know what's going to happen with your investments in the long term. So uh, check it out below. The coupon code is WEALTH. Uh, W-E-A-L-T-H. Now, without further ado, let's jump straight into what we've got in store here. I made a couple of notes, but we can, of course, stray off the subject too. So feel free to ask me questions. That's really why I am live Tuesdays to Saturdays for about an hour each day. So do ask me questions. I, I love getting them. Now, the first thing is, of course, the headline is this, this sort of bull trap situation. What does it really mean, bull trap? It basically means we get a sort of false hope that it, a sell-off is recovering. And in fact, we are not really. So you get that little bit of a spike. Everybody gets excited. Everybody starts buying too early before the technical indicators tell them to because they think uh, things are turning around and then things go the other way. Now, why might that be the case? Well, we've got a c couple of... Um, not the happiest of news, uh, but don't worry, there is some really good news in here for Palantir especially. One, we have a new COVID strain out and it's discovered in South Africa. It's in every uh, borough or whatever they call it in South Africa in, in every province. It is also in Congo, in Mauritius, it's in Switzerland, it's in Portugal, it's in China. And it has the same characteristics as the Delta strain, but apparently it's mutating faster and it could be more infectious. So glorious news, hey, uh, for all of us who are rather tired of the COVID story, there does seem to be another leg to it. So that's something the market is going to have to digest. Now, that strain was first discovered in May when it was sort of a very isolated case, but now it seems fairly rampant and it's spreading around the world, much as, co as the Delta variant did in the previous ones. So the market's going to absorb it. Why? Because uh, Palantir, sorry, uh, Bloomberg is talking about it. Uh, and therefore, I think everybody who's reading and following financial news is going to be looking at this. So this is something that's going to concern some people. Uh, and I can totally understand why. And so you have to kind of look at those COVID trades again, and we can discuss that. Now, good news. Let's Let's sort of have some happy news here as well. Palantir got two massive contracts extensions today. And this is not your one or two million dollar contract. These are big, juicy contracts from the Air Force and also from the NIH. And these are big ones. And I think these are contracts for life. I call them lifers because these are going to stick around. They're going to be there every year. They're going to get extended every single year and they're going to get bigger every year. And that is what we need to get Wall Street to understand so that they really move Palantir stock. But I think Palantir is, is on a really good trajectory here in terms of technicals as well. So I'm looking pretty bullish on that. We're going to look at some NEO numbers. The NEO uh, registrations for the last seven months compared to who they say their competition is, which is BMW, Benz and Audi, and they really kick their backside. So that's a big story. Now, there is, of course, also the big story here. I've got Bloomberg open over here, uh, which is uh, last flight out of Afghanistan. Uh, that is, of course, something that isn't directly related to the financial market, but it is a sentiment issue. There are obviously also elements here of, uh, well, certain in industries that definitely benefit from a continued war there. That won't be as continuous as it was before, though I don't think the U.S will completely withdraw from the region. I think we're just going to see a lot more drone strikes and sort of special forces and stuff like that, or we might just simply not hear about it, but they'll be happening. Um, Carmeno says, if there's bad news for Baba, I don't want it. Well, actually, Alibaba had a tremendous day in Hong Kong today. The 9988, which is the local uh, listing, was up like 4% or something like that. We can also look at why that's happening. Uh, Robin Hood is in hot, hot water for... The SEC is essentially indicating that they might ban the order flow thing. And um, what is that really the order flow thing, which I'm so eloquently explaining? Well, when you trade on any no commission or commission free platform, they're still making money out of you somewhere. So they are either trading ahead of you or they are doing it somehow on the spread. Uh, some, so somehow in the back end of the brokerage, they are making money and they're also using your data and they're selling it and other bigger fish in the market can sort of snap up those shares just ahead of you and so on. So 
you're still paying something. You're basically getting worse prices. So that's really this this illusion of of, of a commission free is just exactly that. It's an, an illusion. And the SEC is also saying they're looking at this gamification of investing. They're not particularly keen on it. They're basically going to look at how these apps incentivize or sort of play with our psychology to be more engaged. You know, just the way that Facebook does or YouTube does. They kind of, you know, keep you on the hook or Netflix is always just like, you know, the next episode comes up just at the right moment and you aren't able to say no. And that's essentially happening with apps. So that's something SEC is looking at and that could definitely hurt Robin Hood uh, and Weeball and others uh, who are in that space. Now, what might also really hurt them or could be of tremendous benefit, depending on how you look at it, is that PayPal is about to enter that space. And while I talk about that, let me show you the futures here at the moment. The future is normally bright and green. Today is looking a little bit more red. Uh, so basically Dow Jones, NASDAQ and S&P are both all down 0.1 of a percent volatility up just a touch. But this is not dramatic stuff. This is not a sort of, you know, panic, crash, dig a hole, uh, buy ammunition, bury some gold like Palantir is doing in the backyard. It's not that kind of a day. It's just one of those days where we have a bunch of news that's coming in together that isn't particularly wonderful. Of course, we also have the uh, the hurricane in the US, a huge areas uh, who have no power. Uh, now, I put up a post yesterday saying this should be good for, for Tesla's Powerball and, and and solar, but they have a backlog of orders. I appreciate that. But I still think this is going to drive. Uh, there is a lot of there are great parts of the United States that have these uh, sort of natural disasters fairly frequently uh, with a fairly high predictability. And if you are there and you have a house and you have a little bit of money, wouldn't you just want to be independent from the grid? So I think this is going to be a boon for Tesla and similar companies like Tesla, which is basically just Tesla, because there isn't really anybody similar to Tesla. Um, China threatening to ban e-commerce companies that flout IP law, says Andre. Uh, yes, you are right. It's in fact an old story, Andre, that of course the media is sort of picking up again. It's about a week old. And I'm not telling you off, by the way, for reading it now. Uh, better now than never. But essentially what it's all about is the Chinese regulators have said, if you want to list, you have to show that you comply with all Chinese laws, which seems reasonable. And one of those steps is that they need to comply with a sort of um, national security data protection type law. And that's a sort of the, the, the flip side of the coin of ByteDance, you know, TikTok, who had to move all their storage for international users from the Alibaba cloud to some international cloud. I don't know where they went, Amazon or somewhere, because the US government really didn't like that, that it was stored there. So this is the same kind of discussion and argument. So is it an enormous issue? I don't think it is. I think this is actually, the idea here is to make IPOs more reliable and for a DD never to happen again. So I, I do think that DD now they are essentially a Chinese operator. They need to store their Chinese data in China and they need to stay, store their overseas data in those overseas markets. And there is a big announcement from Google today. They're investing billions in Germany for more cloud storage. And why are they putting that there? Because they want to serve the local German and European market and people are more comfortable storing their data under local laws. So data protection is something that's creeping up all around the world. So I don't think it's quite the enormous story that um, you know is out there. But you are right; it is sort of hitting um, here. Um, Quacky, what's that? Um, so my, my phone was playing me back. Uh, so I think this is kind of old news that's being being repurposed for not quite the purpose that it was put out. Because really, what the regulator says in China, we want to make IPOs better and more predictable. We want to make sure that DD never happens again. And this will actually be good for us investors in Chinese equities. So, um, Angel, thank you very much for your comment. Um, and Adam, yeah, we know we've had, you, Adam, you are completely right. We've had a lot of negative nonsense on Alibaba since uh, about Christmas time, really, a little bit before that too. Uh, so, um, And Simon, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that. I think local data storage is, is going to be what, what, what will be happening. And you know what? There will be some really 
good opportunities for small cloud operators because not everybody is going to want to, you know, uh, someone like Amazon or, or, or Alibaba or, 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 or you know, any, any other big cloud provider are not going to set up a data center in every single country. So there will definitely be, be interesting companies to look out for there. Um, Okay, the amendment to the e-commerce law, Rudy, there, okay, we are talking about the China tech bull traps, the story here. Um, essentially, they are saying that the platforms, so your Alibaba's, your, your Tencent's, your, 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 uh, you know, your WeChat's, your PDD's, your JD's, are responsible for IP breaches, not just for the data, but also for the products being sold. Now, this is something that Alibaba did quite a lot about I can't quite remember, a good year ago or so, uh, they really went out to eliminate fakes. Why? Because they wanted to get the business of the great big luxury companies, which they've been exceptionally successful at getting. And um, therefore, I think they're actually quite ahead on that front. So I don't think that's going to really hurt them. So see, regulation in itself isn't always a bad thing. If you are the biggest guy in, in around, you're the biggest fish, then it's a good thing. Now, there is a lovely headline today in the uh, South China Morning Post, which is a Hong Kong paper, which is Alibaba owned, funnily enough. And it says, President Xi says, big tech crackdown is making progress, calls for the party to guide companies. And this is just a classic picture, isn't it? I wanted to use it as a, as a thumbnail, actually. I just think I just love that. It's just so brilliant. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, the, the whole point of this is common prosperity. That's his, his, his sort of key word at the moment. And they want to the disorderly expansion of capital. Uh, that's sort of what he's saying. But he's also basically saying there's going to be more regulation to come. And we've already had quite a lot. Obviously, we've had Ant, we've had Alibaba. Uh, we've lost about a trillion US dollars in valuations. And But uh, they are essentially going to continue. Uh, the aim here isn't to sort of crack down and destroy business. The aim isn't to sort of destroy capitalism. I think that would be a gross misinterpretation of what's happening in China, the country that has had the most economic success of any country ever, 30 years of incredible economic growth, no one's ever done that. So I, I always think the word communist is completely misplaced, but I know everybody uses it. So that, that, there we go. But it no longer means what it, what it once meant. It basically means... Um, socialism of, of, of some sort and every country is socialist but let's not go into 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 politics here uh, but he's basically saying uh, the government should guide companies to obey leadership and serve the big picture development of china's economy and society and there is a a particularly kind of a, a kind of gaming example here that really describes very well what this is all about and essentially at the moment, or what the what the new rule is now, that if you are have a have an online game, which is what all games are nowadays, here is the announcement. Um, there's a notice for the further strict management and effective prevention of minors from indulging indulging. I love the translation in online games, and that means they can only provide one hour of gaming to minors, so that's people below the age of 18, from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and statutory holidays. At no other point are minors to be allowed near an online game. And that's pretty draconian, you might say. And I, I would agree with you on that. That's a pretty extreme case of regulation. You know, you might think it's a nanny state, but if you step back from a moment without your investor hat on, there is probably some benefit in that. I mean, I think if we got rid of television and games, uh, or these sort of streaming type games, which are again designed to be addictive, right? Uh, they were addict addictive in my youth, but imagine how addictive they are now once you know people have really spent a lot of money on psychologists and so on. So yeah, it's not great for Tencent or, or uh, Billy Billy or these kind of stocks. Definitely not. But it might actually serve a longer per term purpose. Now, most great entrepreneurs uh, do not really watch television. They do not play games uh, because they want the time to do something more interesting with themselves and they want to think. And when you're playing a game, there is an element that it can be not harmful. I agree with you on that. I used to play computer games when I was much younger. Uh, and some of them are, are quite 
intelligent, uh, but the sort of first-person shooter type thing probably isn't all that intelligent, though it can be fun. I appreciate that. But this is, this is kind of what's happening. So expect a lot more of this kind of regulation that we might think, well, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Why should they do that? Isn't that for parents to do? Well, very hard, actually, for parents to police this. So here the state is doing that. Um, Somebody says, uh, did I miss the new news? No, no, we'll get to that in just a second. But Downton, thanks for tuning in. It is crazy stuff. It, it is. I mean, you kind of find it hard to believe until you actually read it. But there isn't, I don't think there is ill intent here against the companies. I think there is literally somebody sitting there going, if all the young people just sit around and play computer games, they become stupid and they become fat. Uh, so let's do something about it. And most people in the world would say, well, let's encourage them to play football or games or something, you know, I mean, outside, you know, to do that sort of thing through schools, perhaps. And they simply go, no, you can only play computer games between eight and nine o'clock on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays uh, and on the occasional statutory holidays. So uh, in, 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 insane, in a sense. But is it, you know, I don't think there is a sort of bad intent here. That, that's the sort of the way I look at that. Um, uh, first seven says first person shooter games improve perception and cognition and I agree with you on that I do think there are a lot of very intelligent games that teach you a lot of things and you know you can learn very quick uh, reactions and those sort of type things but after our four or five or six it probably drains more creativity from you than it is it is, is giving you so it's not banning games it's just limiting them very very severely um, Liddy thinks it's a funny regulation. It, it, it is it just sort of a, yeah, I mean, it's a bizarre one. That's why I screenshotted it because I couldn't quite believe it when I read it. So I thought you might not believe me either. Um, uh, Desmond, good evening to you. Okay, you, you're saying that basically there are issues around with minors and addiction. Also bear in mind, a lot of these games require in-game purchases so there could also be financial problems here that you know miners are, are getting into debt and so on so cyrus thank you very much for for joining um and kevin yes i think you have a point with social media platforms we've already seen that with with uh, with tencent uh, the wechat platform for uh, their for for sort of miners again that they have uh, they are taking them to court over it so again they're really really cracking down on that and they did one of the key things also with you remember the ant alibaba story was that and was lending money to students, whether they were school or college students who had no income whatsoever, and they could get into debt to, into the tune of many thousands of US dollars. And the government was really put off by that one because there is some responsibility. I think there is some responsibility with, for companies to kind of rein in what they're doing, but uh, no, no rational company would of course limit the use to their, to their product uh, to just an hour a day. Uh, but so what we're going to see, we're probably going to see uh, game launches delayed. I think we are going to see a whole range of new games being developed that people can enjoy in a very, very short period of time because there's no point in playing some sort of strategy game that takes, uh, you know, 300 hours to get through if you can only play it for three hours a week. Uh, that's not really going to catch on. So there will be a lot of changes in that sector. It's not going to go away. Um uh, and Simon says minors could use their parents' phones. Okay, they, they certainly could. Uh, you, you are quite right there. But then it becomes a parental issue. Uh, it, it, you, know, you can't, well, you know, they obviously are trying here to, to kind of micromanage, but you, there's only so much you can uh, micromanage. Um, and first and seven says, I'm pretty sure uh, not all parents give their cards to kids. And also you're saying that the revenue for minors is only 3%. Uh, that's a very interesting statistic. Thanks for showing that out there. Um, Uh, <laughs> Lily is saying some funny things here. Um, and Pascal, yes, of course, offline games, but they are not really the the the, the trendiest. I mean, all the uh, the sort of people I know below below uh, substantially below the age of eighteen, they play online stuff. They like to play together, like to compete and that kind of thing. And I get that. I mean, in my days, you had to have a had to have a cable and connect two computers together, which was obviously the the, the dark ages. I mean, I mean, I was you know the dinosaur times when I was around, but it, it is just a lot more fun, isn't it, with more people around? So. Um, now, what else have we got here? We talked a little bit about the China uh, tech issues. Basically, regulation is going to continue. Uh, does that mean one shouldn't buy any tech or Chinese stocks? 
my view on that is uh, I think one can nibble continuously, so say nibble a little bit once a month. Uh, just bear in mind that some of those companies are going to get really, really hit. So diversification might be a good one. And I think targeting some smaller companies might be a good one. And I have I have in the past uh, shared some of those ideas with uh, with our uh, Patreon group here, Discord group. If you go into the Chinese stock sector, I quite often share things about lesser known stocks. Um, I, I can't pull one up here right now, but there, there are definitely articles and I keep doing that because I think it's the small stocks that will actually benefit from this because they haven't got any of the antitrust issues. They're not big enough to really be affected by a lot of the stuff. And in a way, the government wants more. They definitely want more competition. Uh, President Xi said today that the antitrust regulation is making good progress. So that's definitely the, the direction things are heading into. Now, uh, let's talk quickly Palantir and then we'll talk Neo because both have some interesting news. So Palantir, I shared earlier today with you guys on the Discord, the NIH contract and the um, Air Force contract. So if you're not yet on the Discord, what are you waiting for? Will you join our Patreon link below? That'll get you there. It'll cost you 50 cents a day because I want to keep it small. I want to keep it kind of tight. I want to keep it to people who are interested in contributing and researching and sharing and discussing. And that's what we're doing over there. So if that sounds interesting to you, it's not a Reddit channel. It's very, very different because we're actually debating things, which I truly appreciate. So thanks to everybody who's over there already. So there are two great, big, beautiful beasts of contracts. One is the um, NIH contract. And that is an extension, but it isn't just a small little extension. It takes the contract value from 36 million to 40 mil to 60 million rather. So that's 24 million dollars extra for um, an, ex an additional year. So you can therefore also see that the setup fee they paid Palantir was 12 million. Uh, in year one, they're paying them 24 million on top. In year two, they're paying them another 24 million. So that's pretty juicy contract. What is that about? Well, this basically handles uh, everything from uh, COVID to, um, you know, cancer research to uh, the president's, uh, whatever, fight against AIDS, whatever it's called, the president's emergency plan for AIDS, AIDS relief. Um, I'm always baffled that AIDS hasn't been properly fixed yet. It's been around since the 80s and all we've got is you're going to take lots and lots of medication on a daily basis. It does make me wonder sometimes if there is some a financial incentive there, but you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, never mind. Let's not go down the, the <laughs> conspiracy route here, but it is rather odd, isn't it, that we can fix a lot of things, but we can't fix AIDS completely. So, uh, Moderna will fix AIDS as first seventh. Okay, interesting. Um, do you think it'll fix it completely, or is it again one of those things you got to take every every month or every six months or something? So this is good news, and why is this good news? Because Uncle Sam is going to give this money to Palantir till the end of time. That's the way I see it. Basically, lots and lots of federal agencies are hooked in on this and more and more will be. And the more it grows, the more expensive it will be to move it to another system, another platform. This one works. Why would they change it? So this money is going to go up somewhat more than inflation absolutely every year. And it's just money printing. And I love it for that. Now, but then we also have, this is really, really exciting Air Force. In fact, I had a little... Um, this is not just Air Force, but this is also Space Force. So you want to see a little Space Force video? Here's a lovely little Space Force video. So this is the contract which you might have heard about earlier in the year. In um, May, I believe, or April, they were awarded uh, 32 million, I think. 32 million for Project Brown Heron. Uh, and that was basically to ingest and digest all the Air Force data out there and encourage you to click that like button. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Um, and getting all those data sources together from a maintenance point of view, from a equipment planning, health of, of, of employees, and of course, also operational stuff. And within that contract, they tucked something in because I think they didn't want the world to know exactly how much they're spending on Space Force. So within that contract from um, the end of April is also the basically situational awareness and command and control 
capabilities at the National Space Defense Center. In, um, and that's interesting, I think, because that's, of course, satellites and all those things. There was a beautiful video out by Palantir a week ago. So if you haven't seen that yet, check out their, their um, YouTube channel. And now they've increased that by 48.5 million. So hang on, only five months ago, Palantir got 36 million. Now they're getting an extra 48 million. Is that a happy customer or is that a happy customer? So this contract is now worth $91.5 million. And um, this is basically, as far as I'm aware, this is for two years. So I think this basically extends this. Uh, till till next year if I'm not entirely mistaken so uh, this is um yeah fantastic and it just it means more air force money more space money so this is good news right and actually somebody shared in our discord group that I haven't read yet sml uh, thank you very much you shared this us the next ai campaign um loading 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 okay we let that load for a second i think this is more us expansion into the ai space um, okay. Um, sometimes I can't open a US military sites because I'm based in Hong Kong and that obviously makes me the enemy. So uh, sometimes those links don't work unless I use a workaround. So this is pretty exciting stuff to me. Uh, lots and lots of money flowing in here from these Space Force chaps. And Palantir is a has had a really good story, I, I would say. We have moved very substantially I should really make this a green arrow because it is a positive move. We essentially moved from down here in the sort of uh, $22, $23 into very solidly into the $25 range. And even though today pre-market we are down just a touch, I wouldn't worry too much about that because we are nicely in this uh, positive trajectory up here. I think we are going to crawl up towards the 30s again. I do think it's going to be a crawl because the so-called smart money. The big Wall Street guys still don't like Palantir. They basically shrugged off the great earnings and they went, well, yes, that was really good, but can they do it again? Uh, that was really basically the summary there. And, and, and they're not buying. Though there is money pouring in from the Russell inclusions. And you can see that now on Fintel. Uh, lots of Russell money, uh, Russell 2000, Russell 3000 inclusion. So lots of ETFs uh, basically having to buy uh, Palantir, whether they want to or not, which is, of course, good news. Um, I do actually have, if you're a Palantarian, uh, there is a free thing I created for you. Uh, you can go and download this. Let me show you what the link is for that. Um, where did it go? It's here somewhere. Um, it's um, OK, I'll, I'll write it out for you. So the link, if you want to download something, is felixfriends.org slash palant, P-L-T-R. And that gives you a discounted cash flow model uh, with also a full explanation of, of how I arrived at that. I take you through the whole thing. So check that out if you are uh, deeply into Palantir. It is entirely free and I think you'll find it useful. CH, uh, welcome. Uh, 230 folks watching um, and only 64 have hit the like button. Yes, exactly. Shall I, shall I go into a dark corner and weep because <laughs> no one's hit the like button? Uh, will you hit that like button? It would make me very, very happy. Uh, Samuel, um, hey, I was just talking about you, uh, about what you posted on the AI, which uh, wouldn't load for me, but I, I will uh, cover it later. Um, I uh, appreciate all the likes. They're pouring in. Thank you very much for that. So I will do, of course, a quick, a quick recap just in a moment, but let's talk a little bit about NEO uh, while we are here. Now, the first thing about NEO is that NEO really wants you to join the master stocks course down below because it gives you a wealth of information and you'll be able to analyze and read financial statements and you'll be able to sleep soundly no matter what the market does because you know what your strategy is. You know where your money is heading. And that's the kind of confidence and strategy in market psychology as you will understand. So check it out down below. Links are down below and the coupon code is WEALTH. That is valid till the end of the week. Now enough of the self-serving adverts and let's talk a little bit about NEO here and I will pull up a chart for you and show you why I'm excited about NEO. And I'm particularly excited about NEO because the market isn't. So let me 
make myself a little bit smaller here. And I've scribbled all over this, for which uh, I, I apologize. <laughs> but there is some madness to the scribbles. So this is the January to July 2021 SUV registrations, is sort of insurance registrations. And you can see who is the absolute uh, uh, goat in the house. Well, it's, of course, Tesla. So this Model Y here is Tesla. But I'm not really that interested in that for this purpose because the Model Y isn't really a neo competitor because the price point is just too different. So what we have instead is we have the ES6, the EC6, and the ES8 uh, together. That's 49,000 neos registered in the first seven months of this year in the SUV EV space. Now, the real competition of neo, as William Lee keeps reminding us, is. BBA, BMW, Benson, Audi, the horrible Germans. Um, I, I think I can say that because I am German. And nothing horrible about them. They build great cars, but they're getting left behind in the EV space. And BMW sold off their iX3 just 9,100. So that's 18% of NEO in the space. Mercedes is even more horrific with only 3,400 cars of their EVs, SUVs sold. That's 6% of Neo's performance. And Audi, I mean, we don't even really want to talk about that. Uh, Audi is basically weeping, whimpering below the table, uh, selling 790. So that's like a, a bit more than 100 cars a month they're getting registered here. So that does that mean that BBA is completely out of business? No, BBA is selling 150,000 cars per month in China. But they are, as you can see, almost entirely ICEs. And the ICEs will go out of business. Yes, the government will make sure of it because they will simply not give you licenses. They will not give you permits. And they will eventually, I think, tax you out of business. So what does that mean? Um, well. If NEO could catch half of the market share of BBA, which in the in the EV space, I mean, they are just completely, uh, you know, dragging them through the mud and laughing. That half of that market share, so seventy five thousand cars, that would fill NEO Park's capacity of a million vehicles a year. So is that achievable? I think it is. I, I think it is. And I think BBA are going to have a tough time. I think they underestimate the Chinese interest in buying a domestic luxury brand versus the Germans. And unless they do some real magic there, the Germans, they are going to be seriously left behind, as they already are. I mean, look at this chart. This is appalling. And this is without Neo having any sedan. So we're not looking at the sedan comparison here, but we will be able to do that next year as well. And I think it's going to be a similar story. So I'm actually very, very bullish on Neo, And the market doesn't seem to get it. And actually, I quite like that. I like being the contrarian in the room. It may Makes what I want to buy cheap and I can nibble at it every month. Now, another bit of news is here. Uh, well, you've seen battery swap stations, right? We've all seen them now. Is it exciting? Uh, you know, is, is it exciting that we're seeing a box here? Well, how many did they build today? Tuesday, 17. They launched 17 battery swap stations today in one day. And since Saturday, they launched 36 battery swap stations. So these guys have put their mind to it. They now have the partners uh, with Sinopec and many others. All those deals we were discussing at the beginning of the year when people were saying, well, what does it mean? Why is it important? Well, one of the reasons that Tesla have been so successful in the United States is, well, look at where Tesla is most successful. It's where they have the most charging infrastructure. And that's the model that NEO is following. Plus also, these battery swap stations mean that a NEO is, is cheaper than a BMW, Benz or Audi on an upfront cost. And you know you're going to be able to get your hands on the latest battery tech. And you really know when you're buying an EV that in, say, 18 months, you're basically driving around with your grandma's battery, right? It's just not what you want to be driving around with. And the advances in battery tech are going to be basically, I'd say, like, like computer chips in the 90s, where you saw that, I don't know, every 18 months it doubles in capacity or speed. That's essentially what we're going to see, I think, with batteries. So this is going to be an issue. And on a side note there, um, Tesla is rumored to be using CATL for their uh, US build um, Teslas going forward. There is apparently a big, big contract there in the offing. 
Um, and uh, Desmond says it's crazy, 17 in one day. Absolutely, it is. And I mean, people were saying, well, how are they going to get to the, the 500 or the 700 at the end of the year? Well, if they're doing 17 a day uh, and 36 over the weekend, including these 17, uh, you can see how they can quite easily get there. So uh, they are busy. There are some people who are really, really busy installing these battery swap stations. And also bear in mind that each one of those is basically a massive billboard, right? If you just look at the way these are built, they look very swanky. They look lovely. They've got a great big Neo logo on them. Everybody sees them. Everybody knows it's a Neo. So it's a perma billboard on top of it. So there is some marketing benefit in here as well. Um, first, seventh. Um, so Tesla is using the BID blade battery, uh, I think, for the Model Y in China. But apparently the rumor is, and this is, I think this comes from Deutsche Bank. They are saying that for, for the US, they're going to use CATL. Uh, and there are obviously some issues with uh, Korean, some certain Korean batteries. I think it's LG, right, who uh, keep keep going up in, in in flames with with GM. Though I do think, and I do bag on GM quite a lot. I do think they are being fairly harshly hit here with this because, you know, when you drive over an anchor or a, a pickaxe or something, which is what these cases are, uh, and it goes up in flames, then is that really the fault of GM? I think something like. I don't know, I've forgotten what the number was now. I think it's 20,000 car fires a year or something happened in the US. Maybe it's even more than that. I forgot what the number was, but it was five or six digits, massive amounts. And none of those make the paper, right? No one goes, well, we should ban ICEs. We should sue, you know, whoever. No one thinks about that because it's just accepted. Cars drive around with petrol and that's flammable too. So I think really we need to look at each case and, and, and not just sort of, uh, you know, beat up a poor GM over this. Um, uh, first seventh, okay, he, he, I, I'm not going to put any money into GM or Ford. I think Ford is possibly worse than GM uh, as, a, as a stock, but I, I do think it is harsh on them. Really, the mistake isn't theirs. The mistake is LG's. Roadrunner is asking, do you think they're going to get to 8,000 cars? So you're talking about delivery numbers for... Um, for the month, basically, which we are going to get in in a day or two, aren't we? Uh, let me pull this up here on our. Um, I'll, I'll show you guys too. Let me just pull up the back end of our Patreon. If you're not on there already, uh, you are very welcome to join. The links are down below, and we track lots of stuff on there, lots of research information, and of course the access to the Discord. But one of the things we track on here are delivery numbers and that is always quite a useful thing to look at and to sort of get and put numbers into perspective. So when you throw out 8,000 there, you know, what, what do they need? Well, let me zoom in a little bit on this. So what they need is essentially the guidance for the quarter is 23 to 25,000 cars, right? In July, we delivered 7,900. So we need to deliver 8,500 per month to get there. So they could do 8,000 this month and 9,000 next month, or they could do 8,500-ish each month. Uh, I, I sort of think it's going to be a, a low 8,000 number. I think we're going to get there. If I had to put money on it, I would think maybe something like 8,2 or 8,3 or something. I think they could do more from a demand side of view, point of view, but I think the chip shortage is still biting them in the, uh, in the backside. Um, Simon thinks GM and Ford are going to go bankrupt. Well, you know what? If they do, I think they'll get bailed out and I think they'll come around again. There is a marvelous thing. I've just dropped my pen. One second. <laughs> Here it is. Um, the, there's a marvelous thing called the US bankruptcy laws. And they basically pretty much allow you to pile up a load of debt, billions of it, go through bankruptcy proceedings, make a bunch of lawyers and accountants a lot of money, and then you keep going, and the only people left holding the bag are those who own those, those corporate bonds. So they take a haircut, and then they're back. Uh, and it's all in the sort of interest of uh, preserving employment, but really, it's a bit of a racket, uh, that whole system. So I think even if some of these big companies like Ford and GM do go into financial trouble, I think they are just going to keep piling up more debt in the process, and one day they're just going to write it off, and they're going to be like, huh, we're back. Uh, so, you know, uh, but first, seventh, I'm with you. Ford is massively debt-laden, and I wouldn't go near it with a barge pull. If somebody 
gifted me a share of thought, uh, I would I would probably give it back. Um, and Desmond says that they use the funds to buy back their own stocks to enrich their stakeholders too. There, there is an element of that, Desmond. It is a strange system. I think the original intention was a fairly decent one that uh, we shouldn't necessarily shutter companies completely just because they went into bankruptcy. But the present system seems to very much encourage lots of debt. Money is free. Who cares? Uh, and then if we, we, we go into bankruptcy, well, we just write it all off. Investment banks make a lot of money. Everyone's happy. Wall Street's happy. And, and you know, the saga continues and gets repeated. So uh, let's have a look at the market here. Uh, da, 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 where did it go? Where did the market go? <laughs> um, let me open up the live market here and I'll share it to you because we are 10 minutes into it. And let's see what's going on here. PDD is flying, uh, Yushin as well, GameStop, JD. So quite a lot of the Chinese stocks are having a nice recovery day. And Lee up, SOS up, Neo up 1.7%, Palantir up 26 dollars So this is likely on the back of the news of those two wonderful contract extensions. And I think people are also starting to realize, hang on, this extension is going to happen each year. So this is just, this is a real compounder internally. Now what's down? Facebook is at zero, basically. Coin just down a little. Tesla down 0.2%. Not sure what that's all about. That might just be, you know, QQQ is actually down down 0.3%. So today is a tech growth morning. And Apple is down a little bit. So a little bit of a flight out of the safe tech stocks into the more uh, aggressive, risky tech stocks. Um, there was the corporate lawyer speaking, says Alex. Yes, yes, I should apologize for that always profusely. I used to be a corporate lawyer. Uh, and, and, and yeah, there is, you know, they make a lot of money, but the Americans have taken it to a whole new level. So, I, you know, congratulations to anybody who's in the US uh, corporate uh, law game. They are, they are making some serious money. Um, First seven says you don't get Lee. Well, Lee is reasonably successful, right? They are selling quite a lot of uh, cars in China. They have a good reputation for building a sort of um, low-cost, reliable product. And they are sort of part of the three musketeers. So they are somehow being also pulled along by, by Xpang and by Neo. Uh, for me personally, I'm not that wild on Lee. I think they lag behind on the R&D side. I think they lag behind on the autonomous driving side. And that's really where the future is. I think that's really where the money is. So uh, for me, it's not something I would buy, but I can still see, you know, you don't have to be the best to kind of get dragged along with a whole industry change and upheaval, which is what we are seeing here. So, um, you know, there is always the follower. That doesn't mean you need to buy the follower, but there certainly is something. Um, Palantir is to test 2650, uh, which is very, very exciting. Um, almost as exciting as joining my master stocks course and the private chat community that comes with that. So if you are interested in properly valuating companies, learning how to do discounted cash flow models yourself, learning how to properly understand and be confident in your reading of financial statements and understanding market psychology and much, 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 much more, uh, check it out. It's completely risk-free. You can take the whole course and ask for your money back. Uh, that's, that's how I roll. So check out the coupon down below, 29% off Wealth is the coupon valid till the end of the week. Now, here's Bloomberg talking about... Um, no, 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 sorry. They're talking about something old. Never mind Bloomberg. PDD is indeed going ballistic. Well, you can sort of see why. I, I think their whole focus on agricultural goods is a, something the government is particularly keen on. They are also not the dominant player in their space. You know, that's that's Barber and, and JD, although they are doing well as well today. So you can kind of see why they are kind of beneficiaries to an extent of this. Plus, they have all been beaten up tremendously, right? Let me show you the PDD chart. I mean, they have all had a bit of a bit of a ride. You see, it goes off the chart quite literally. So these stocks, PDD was trading at... 211 in February, now it's at 98. So it's it's been beaten up pretty severely. We are basically back to October 2020 levels. Um, so people are seeing value. We are substantially below 
the 100 day moving average line you know people often look for that kind of gap and to close that gap so i think that's why this is also a good a b20 hatch is talking about the um gas pedal breaking off so what i read about it is essentially that's a feature <laughs> it's not a bug it's a feature so essentially apparently gas pedals are designed so that if you put lots of force on them um either sideways or um, sort of in a frontal way they're designed to break off because in an accident you and your legs lurch forward and if there was a completely a fixed steel thing down there it would break your leg so the intention is for it to actually fall off whether or not that is really the explanation here i don't know but that's basically the explanation that that neo has been floating around um, um Mikhail says you have to buy one a hold for a year now Baba Neo or Palantir well does that mean I have to sell it after exactly one year you see I would never do that I would always buy things and aim to hold them for a much longer time horizon than a year uh, unless there is some real technical like irrational sell-off and I might just want to take some profits but most of the time I buy things and I want to hold them for for sort of near forever uh, which is a sort of five ten year horizon at the very least um uh, desmond okay you you agree with me there on that on that um uh, brake uh, or rather the accelerator yes i hope the same doesn't apply to the brake you wouldn't really want the brake to fall off now would you but the accelerator isn't necessarily such a horrible thing uh, you just have to sort of coast to to the side somewhere but i don't know how they how they managed to do that uh, I, i've never managed to break that off in a car so it could be a could be a bug and not a feature um uh, Mikael, okay, which one? All right, okay. Mikael is saying, if, if I could buy something right now and hold it for the long term, would it be Baba, Neo, or Palantir? It's a tough call, really. You want me to pick one? I would say Neo. I think the imminent story change there is the greatest because we're getting two sedans next year. We're getting massive capacity boost next year. We have restraint supply of all the competitors because of the chip shortage. So I think also what they've created with user engagement and user loyalty and and uh, research and so on is is better than what say bmw mercedes audi have managed to create so uh, i i would pick that one um I think if Felix had to pick one, it would be PayPal, says Desmond. Well, you, you, you know me, Desmond. I, I can never resist buying a bit of PayPal. And speaking of PayPal, Desmond, you see you got me off on one now, is uh, PayPal is rumored to be entering the sort of Robinhood Webull stock trading app space. And we can already uh, trade cryptos in some form or another on PayPal. Apparently, they're going to launch that in the US. Now, they need a license for that. And that might take them something like eight months to get. So the rumor is that they're going to acquire something. So there could be some real money in some of the probably the smaller brokerages that have a license so watch that space they've hired some really smart people for that i might well put out a video on this because i think it's quite an interesting one and this is going to turn the heat up on robin hood as well because paypal is unlikely to follow the same business model given what the sec is saying here um uh, and the drug was says there are no competitors to palantir they're in their own space and i agree with you on that completely uh, i don't think there is anybody out there and i would ha be happily buy palantir any day uh, it's just we were talking about a one-year horizon palantir is going to shine i think after one year uh, i think it's going to take some time to really convince people that um it's happening and then we've just got the chicago um the michigan uh, business index in at 66 it was estimated at 68. Okay, so sentiment is still a little bit worse than people are hoping for. Uh, and the US 10-year yield has just come down a little bit more as well, which is good, I suppose, for us growth stocks because it just means the whole inflation story isn't really an issue. Uh, Wasim, can PayPal buy SoFi? Now, wouldn't that be lovely? They could. It's, um, is it likely? I mean... If there is somebody out there who's a bit smaller and a bit cheaper, I think PayPal is more likely to do that because they'd be buying them for the license. Um, and SoFi is 
trading at 11 billion market cap, so they'd probably have to pay 15 or something like that. So that's even to PayPal a, a, a fair bit of change. So I think they would look out for one of the smaller, less successful brokerages who have the license in place and simply acquire them and save themselves eight months of regulatory uh, hassle. I think that's really the, the, the key attraction here. Um, <laughs> Mikal says, no competition to Palantir is losing money for 20 years. Okay, uh, I think we can take the joke. Um, now, let me do a quick recap here of what we were talking about. Let me pull up where we started so that we remember somewhat what this is all about. Um, make, make myself a little bit smaller here. So we've got a new COVID virus discovered. That sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? That sounds like, oh my God, we discovered something. We discovered life on Mars. No, a new COVID vi variant, uh, apparently starting from South Africa, though the World Health Organization will undoubtedly assign it some Greek letter so that we won't know where it came from in case that we hold the South Africans responsible, which I don't think anybody sensible would. Uh, but yeah, that's the way that's going to go. And it's apparently it has uh, similar traits to the Delta variant, but it mutates faster, so it could be significantly more contagious and infectious. And it's already in uh, in South Africa, it's in Congo, it's in Mauritius, it's in Switzerland, it's in Portugal, and it's in China. So it'll be in a place near you soon, coming to cinemas near you, <laughs> a new COVID variant. So that's, of course, going to be a whole new story then about which vaccine will be how effective against that and so on. And... Um, Desmond thinks we're going to run out of Greek letters soon. Well, there are quite a few. I don't know what they're going to do afterwards. Maybe they start going around and they're going to call them, you know, Alpha One or something. Um, <laughs> COVID is like the boogeyman says, end the drug war today. Well, it is a... To the, to, I've spoken to some doctors about it here and they're basically... Because here in Hong Kong, we had SARS, right? And a lot of people in the rest of the world didn't realize that if you weren't living in Asia at the time. But it was sort of like a mini COVID that was very serious at the time. It killed a few hundred people and people got very terrified of this. And COVID is a SARS virus, so it's a similar thing. But they were all saying that COVID, the doctors I've spoken to, is what I, when I say they, is just it mutates much, much, much faster and it's much more contagious than that SARS virus was, which is why it's sort of taken over the world. And um, they think it's going to keep keep mutating, basically. Uh, so that's kind of part of the challenge. Uh, the, the, there'll be a race to more vaccines, be good for Pfizer and so on, which ARC have been buying. They've been buying Pfizer, whereas Buffett has gotten out or more or less out of the pharma game because they obviously think that the... Um, a virus that mutates faster sounds like a fun treatment skill. I know it's all its all about spreading happiness and joy here on our calls. It's all good news. Um, so overall, the market is down somewhat, but the real growth stocks are actually doing quite well. Uh, Paul is asking, how do you think Lucid will perform in the US compared to their peers? I mean, it really depends on the quality of the product they put out, right? If they put out a good quality product, even if it is a little overpriced at the beginning, I think American investors and I think Americans will lap it up because there is very limited choice really in the EV space at the moment. And the pure EVs do have a huge advantage uh, that uh, you don't have to deal with all the legacy nonsense. So um, uh, as Warren said, why he sold PFE, says Alex. No, but I think it's fairly obvious. I think all good value investors buy something and then when it gets to a level where price levels are really very elevated, they get out of it because they've taken probably the majority of the gains and they're just happy to put it to something that's becoming more more predictable. And, you know, we already know they're selling a ton of vaccines. They're going to sell booster shots and so on. So there, this is kind of priced in. So there is a risk that COVID might simply disappear, in which case valuations are going to come back down, or that maybe governments are going to start haggling a bit better and not just pay any price, or perhaps that they might push back on the um, sort of... The, at this point, pharmaceutical companies have zero risk for the vaccines, right? The governments 100% take on all the risk and all the claims all around the world. So the pharma companies are just saying, I'm selling you this to you at whatever price I, I determine and you got to pay up front and I take no risk. It's a great business model. I mean, it's the best business model since, well, drugs really. I think, I think you know, 
um, opium. Uh, that, that, that was a similarly great business model. So this is kind of what, what Pfizer and co are doing at the moment. And that isn't going to last forever. At some point, uh, some lawyers in governments are going to go, do you realize that we are underwriting all claims and all risks and these guys just made 20 billion? Uh, so, you know, there is going to be a bit of a bit of a pullback on that, I think. Um, Uh, any thoughts on SoFi? Yeah, it's not moving all that much, is it? Um, that's kind of the problem with it, really, is let me pull it up for you, is that, whoops, what did I do here? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> okay, I press a button and a video starts playing. So SoFi, here it is. Wow, I really went to town with my annotations there, didn't I? Uh, yeah, I did. So it's kind of limping sideways, and that isn't a bad thing. Uh, you know, we kind of want to establish this $14 as a real baseline. So actually, if we hit this point a few times, I'd be happy. Because at the moment, we are still on this falling knife situation. Yes, momentum is improvement. But you can see this great big red line here that's still pointing very, very much downwards. So we're going to have to be a little bit patient with this one, I think. When the bank charter does get officially announced, I think that's when we're going to gonna, gonna start flying again. Until then, I think it's a sideways hop. Um, so thanks for that question there in the drug war. Okay, I'm glad you agree with me on the opium wars. Um, we can have a conversation about that with, uh, with um, you know, Hong Kong and so on. Uh, Adam is talking about 20 days to the harvest moon. That's when we harvest cars instead of crops. It's in our DNA. Well, hopefully the, the market will pay attention uh, to that. Now, what else have we got apart from COVID uh, happiness? Well, we have great news out for Palantir. We've got two great big contract extensions. We've got an, the NIH contract, which is basically uh, coordinating all the data on cancer research, AIDS research, COVID, and so on of all the federal agencies. They've extended that until oh, September 2022 for a nice big lump sum. And on the even more exciting is the Air Force contract from April just got extended by another 40 odd million. So that's pretty exciting because those contracts are just going to keep rolling. They're going to keep getting extended. They're going to keep getting bigger. And eventually, the smarter analysts will realize, hang on, why on earth would Space Force change their operating system, you know, a couple of years, years into it with the massive risk that, you know, they might lose a satellite or something or something won't work. It's just not going to happen. These contracts are pretty much for life. So, um, <laughs> and the drug war is taking the mickey out of my coordinating all the data. Uh, indeed, that's what they do, right? That's that's the that's the technical description for it. So this is very good news for 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 Palantir, and Palantir is sort of flying a little bit on that news. Um, uh, end of the drug war. You basically think the SPACs could bring in five hundred million in contracts over time. You know what? They could. There is, of course, an element that you invest in 10 SPACs, maybe nine go out of business and one becomes Google, right? That's also another way of looking at it. So some of those will work, some of this will not. In the short term, the revenue from that is pretty modest. What I'm more excited about is actually that they're in the boat with lots of smart people who are intending to disrupt industries. And Palantir will be there from the very beginning. They'll have those conversations and those meetings and they'll be driving the software for that. So when those systems become mainstream, say like, you know, um, air taxis, for example, Palantir can say, yeah, we, we power the guys that, you know, run 40% of all the, um, all the aerial drones in, in the US. And we are the ones who basically made it happen. So then when Boeing goes out and invests in it massively, I know they already are, but, you know, they, they, will, they will use Palantir. And of course, they can also say, well, we also run the military drones. So this kind of early stage learning experience, I think, is also a massively underestimated value out there from those SPAC investments. So I do think they'll pay for themselves many, many times over. Um, we also have... Um, some NEO data out. We looked at the NEO January to July data, which just shows that they are so far ahead of for SUV EV sales from Mercedes, BMW, 
and Audi that those three are really getting left behind. So that's a really interesting story. If you think that BBA sells 150,000 cars a month in China, if they're going to lose a big percentage of that market share, which I think they will to NIO, uh, NIO will be laughing to the bank, as will the, be the shareholders. And also, big story out on Robinhood. Uh, potentially, there could be an order flow ban coming from the SEC. So this very strange way that Robinhood and also many other brokerages, we should add for fairness, uh, provide commission-free trading is that they're sort of, you know, you do something with the order flow or they trade ahead of us or they sell that data. And that is still costing you money. It's just not very obvious. So is it a good system? Is it a bad system? Uh, who knows? But the SEC might come down on that as a, with a ton of bricks or like a ton of bricks. And we also have PayPal rumored to be entering that space. We now have PayPal Invest, a new subsidiary, or rather invest with PayPal. And they've also hired some smart guys from the sector. So I think I might do an extra video on that one because it's an interesting story to dig a bit deeper into. Um, China is talking about more regulation and <laughs> lots more coming in. We've got a fairly um, odd uh, piece of regulation that miners can only play online games between 8 and 9 p.m. on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. And I'm not making this up. This is actually the regulation. So there's some pretty uh, intense stuff coming there. And there will be more of that. You know, I think people investing into Chinese equities need to be aware that there are going to be these... Um, fairly detailed and specific pieces of legislation coming out over the next few months and next few years. Does that put me off Chinese equities completely? No, actually it doesn't. I think it op op opens up some serious opportunities, but be prepared for some massive volatility and possibly not making significant money for quite a long time to come. Uh, new delivery numbers should be out um, tomorrow. Yes, they should be out tomorrow. They're normally pretty punctual on the first, so I will definitely let you know what those are so make sure you subscribe indeed a big red button there if you press that you'll get all the information uh, that i have uh, and will you join the course community we have a whole community of course members like-minded investors like you and me who want to build wealth and they want to do it with stocks and they want to do it in a sensible way truly understanding the value of each stock how they're valued do their own discounted cash flow models, understand the charts, be able to interpret them, where is a good in and out, uh, what is the market sentiment, and also really just understand market psychology because that's hugely important. As you see every day, a lot of the craziness is just about psychology, our own and everybody else's. So if you understand that, I think it's a huge advantage. Uh, so check it out down below. It provides a vast amount of, of uh, knowledge, I think, and I think it gives you a huge, huge return on the investment there with lots and lots of value. So check that out, uh, felixfriends.org slash stocks. I'd love to see you on in the community. And if you have any questions at all, do always ask. I am live Tuesdays to Saturdays, 9 a.m., Eastern time. That's New York time. So figure out where that is, what time that is, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, so feel free to ask me any questions. I apologize. I can't answer every single question. But if you join me a couple of days in a row, I will definitely answer your question because I, I, I do make a point of trying to get through everything here. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I truly appreciate it. I wish you have a lovely trading day. It looks pretty green for the high growth stuff. The less high growth stuff is, is taking a bit of a hit from sort of market sentiment issues here. Uh, but thanks for tuning in and see you tomorrow. Same time, same place.